Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. We've got some that are running just a little late. They'll be here. All right. So we're going to go ahead and start. Amen. Let's just uh, stand up and let's just worship the Lord and buy his presence into this house tonight. My God, I love you. Lord, I worship you and I praise your name, oh God. I give you glory and honor today, God. I thank you. For your love to us tonight, God, we magnify the name of Jesus. We lift up the name of Jesus tonight, God. Uh, come on, give him glory. Let's praise his name. I love you. Lord, I love you, Jesus. I worship you, oh God. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. Let's go ahead and take the request for a prayer. Anybody have a request? Just lift your hand. Let's just carry these before the Lord tonight. My God, right now, Lord, uh, God, you see every hand raised. You know the need they represent. God, we're trusting you tonight, God, that you're going to move upon every one of them, Lord. Uh, God, we're believing you for the healing power of the Holy Ghost to move on those that are sick, God. Uh, Lord, those that are concerning souls, that you would begin to move and stir, God. Uh, Lord, that you would have your way with those souls, God. Uh, Lord, bring people into this house. Let us see people filled with the Holy Ghost. Give us the revival, God. Uh, Lord, that you want this church to have and this city to have, God. Uh, Lord, we give you glory and honor and praise. Come on, let's lift him up right now. My God, I love you, Jesus. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Come on, praise his name. Praise his name right now. Let's glorify him. his name. Praise his name tonight. My God, I love you, Lord. I worship you, oh God. Jesus, we worship you, Lord. My God, I love you, Lord. I praise the name of Jesus tonight. My God,
Jesus. 
service look at it amen it's a it's a oldie but a goodie amen yes. it's a 1920 something model baby grand that was donated to our church and we're just put it back there to use it back there for right now amen when we have events but we're going to eventually hopefully get this expanded out a little bit and have it back out here so we can have live music yeah i'm ready for live music yeah. Yeah, aren't you yeah. hallelujah Amen, amen. Brother Rob, I need your help, Brother uh, Ron. Come on up here. They got your name on her. You can be seated. We want to just, uh, we're going to go back into our lessons, amen, that we had taught before. And I had started teaching back in, I think, November, maybe, last year. And then we got totally sidetracked and didn't get back to it. So we're going to pick it up. And Lord willing, we're going to be doing this every Tuesday night till we get it done. Amen? Unless revival breaks out and something else goes on. And you never know around here what's liable to happen. Hallelujah. Amen. So when we're talking about homeless, I'm just going to kind of give us a quick review as they're passing this out. Uh, this of course is titled Holiness of Spiritual Discipline. And I just basically ask what is holiness? It's a state of being holy, purity or integrity of moral character, freedom from sin, sanctity. Amen. If holiness is a state of being holy, what is the definition of holy? Yeah. It means properly whole, entire, or perfect in a moral sense. Hence, pure in heart. Temper or disposition. Everybody say temper <laughs> or disposition. Free from sin and sinful affections. Amen. Hallowed, consecrated, set apart. Amen. So that's what holiness is. First Peter 1 and 1 said, Be ye holy, for I am holy. That's God. Holiness is purity of heart or disposition, sanctified affections, piety, moral goodness, but not perfect. Sacredness, the state of anything hallowed or consecrated to God or to his worship, that which is separate to the service of God. David said it this way in Psalm 51, 10, created me a clean heart, O God, with the right spirit within me. Jesus said it this way in Matthew 12, 33, either make the tree good and its fruit good or else make the tree corrupt, its fruit corrupt, for the tree is known by its fruit. O generation of vipers, how can you be evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. 
A good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringing forth good things. The evil man out of the evil treasure bringing forth evil things. Amen. So I, I want us to understand in Matthew 15, he said, that Not that which goeth into the mouth defileth the man, but that which cometh out of the mouth, that defileth the man. Why? Because you eat, you put food into your mouth, it doesn't, it doesn't do anything, just helps you get fatter. Amen. But the things that come out of your mouth proceed from your heart. Yeah. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have established this back more than one time that the heart of man is not this ticker in your chest. When the Bible refers to the heart of man, it refers to your central nervous system, your brain and your spinal cord. Everything connects together. Amen. That is the whole heart of a man. Amen. And so you have uh, your own thoughts. Jeremiah 17 said, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Amen. So the heart is a breeding ground for sin. Hallelujah. Matthew 22, Jesus said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. Amen. Heart and mind basically are one and the same. Amen. It is your thought patterns. Know you not that you are the temple of God, the Spirit of God dwells in you. A clean heart is so very important to God because we are God's temple. Amen? And I'm going to get on down the road here. And the next thing David asked of God was, renew a right spirit within me. Psalm 51 and 10. Hallelujah. The word right in that scripture comes from the Greek word corn, meaning to be firmly established or to be fastened. Isaiah 22, 23 said, And I will fasten him as a nail in a sure place. Hallelujah. Romans 8 and 8 says, So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God, but you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so, be the Spirit of God will in you. Hallelujah. I'm just going to skip on down through here. Amen. We, we just understand. And then uh, if we go into James chapter 3, it talks about the tongue being a fire, a world of iniquity. Amen. So is the tongue among our members that it defileth the whole body and set it on fire of the course of nature and it is set on the fire of hell. Amen. That's why the Bible uses tongues as the evidence of the Holy Ghost. You know why that is? That's the last thing you're going to submit to God. Yes, sir. Amen. You'll give God everything else but that tongue. Mmm. Mmm. He ain't getting my tongue and you ain't getting him. Amen. Ephesians 4.22 said, Be renewed in the spirit of your mind, put on a new man, which after God has created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, put away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for remember one of another. Be angry, sin not, let not single down from your wrath, neither give place to the devil, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. But that which is good to the use of edifying it, that may minister grace unto the hearers, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Amen. So he said, I want you to talk nice. I want you to be right. Hallelujah. We used to say, you're going to walk upright and spit white. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 I said, everybody like, what? <laughs> Amen. You want to spit white. You ain't going to have that brown spit in your mouth. All right. For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among... Everybody say, come out from among them. Out from among, them. among who? Amen. The world. Amen. Be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Amen. So, he wants us to come out from among the world. He does not want us to be. He, in one scripture, he said, we're in the world, but we're not of the world. Amen. You, you live in this world, but you're not a part of this world. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Once you've received the gift of the Holy Ghost, once you've received the gift of God in your life, you don't belong to this world anymore. This world is not your home. Yeah. You're only passing through here. Come on. Yeah. Hallelujah. But it is imperative that while you're here, that you live as clean and sinless a life as possible. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, God occasionally has to chasten us. It's not pleasant. Amen. We don't like getting a whooping. But every now and then I've got a whooping from God. And most of y'all have too. If you haven't, you probably haven't lived for God very long. Amen. All right. 
Romans 8 says, if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you do the spirit, do mortify the deeds of the body or kill the deeds of the body, you'll live. Amen? Hallelujah. So we don't want to do that. We don't want to live after the flesh. We want to live after God. Righteousness, the exalted the nation, the sinners are reproach to any people. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. Amen. So if you look that up in the Amplified, it's brace up and reinvigorate and set up your slackened and weakened and drooping hands and strengthen your feeble and palsied and tottering knees. Amen. Sound about me in the morning. <coughs> Paul tells Timothy that he wants men to be able to pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands. That don't sound like feeble hands, does it? That are hanging down. That's a sign of weakness. Feeble hands that hang down is a sign of weakness. Amen. But he said, brace up and reinvigorate and set right your slackened and weakened and drooping hands. And they're to be holy hands. Amen. Those knees should be used to fight battles in the spirit world. If you're down on your knees, you're more than likely winning battles, warding off spirits of darkness that want to get a foothold in your life. Follow peace with all men and holiness without the which no man shall see the Lord. Did you hear that scripture? Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Now, is holiness just a concept? Yeah, it's a concept God put together. Amen. Is it just for the outside? Is it just a bunch of rules somebody made up about what we're supposed to look like, what we're supposed to look, uh, act like, and how we're supposed to be? No. It's God-given instruction. Hallelujah. And we, we always start, I always start, when I teach holiness, I always start on the inside first. Yes, sir. Because you can decorate the outside up and you can make it look as pretty as you want to. And you can be as clean and holy on the outside and you can be full of dead men's bones. Yes, sir. Yes. Jesus called one group of them whited sepulchers. Amen. Anybody ever seen a sepulcher? Ever been down to South Louisiana when you drive in that truck? And you see them big old... Sometimes they'll be two or three stories tall and there'll be a casket stacked on top of each other in there. That's a sepulcher. That's where they bury the dead. On the outside, they're pretty. I mean, if you go down there in South Louisiana, I've been in big old cemeteries down there, and there'll be, there'll be all kind of floral designs on those things. There'll be crosses on top. There'll be, uh, some of them even have pictures of St. Peter or somebody on there. I guess that's who they think it is. But, no matter how much the outside looks good, the inside is still full of dead people. Amen. So we don't want to be that. We want to be what God wants us to be. Let's go on to lesson two. First Timothy chapter four, verses seven through sixteen said, But refuse profane and old wives fables. Exercise thyself rather unto godliness, for bodily exercise profiteth little. I've been telling y'all that Jim ain't doing y'all no good. But godliness is profitable unto all things. If you'll exercise your prayer bones yes. instead of going to the gym and exercising all that other stuff that don't count. Okay. <laughs> Just a thought. Yep. Hallelujah. Godliness is profitable unto all things. He said, exercise yourself rather unto godliness. Having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. It's not just for this life. Amen. When I practice godliness, I'm not practicing it down here just to be somebody different so I can have a, a little show time, you know. In fact, if you if you practice holiness so you can stretch your stuff on the street and show everybody how different you are, your attitude is the wrong attitude in the first place. You stand. Amen. You, you, you don't need to do holiness so you can show off how holy you are to other people in town that may not be as holy as you. You know why you need to be practicing holiness? You need to be practicing holiness because it, it's from your heart. You love God that much. Hallelujah. Amen. You love God enough that you want to do what God wants you to do. Amen. That's that simple. So godliness is profitable unto all things. Having promise of the life that now is. So you you talk about now. I've never have been in the world. Fortunately, God filled me with the Holy Ghost when I was a young teenager. 
So I've had the Holy Ghost a long time, over 52 years, and, and, and still living for God and still loving God. And guess what? In all this time, I've never looked for a place to turn around and go back. I could have found one if I'd looked for it. Yeah. A lot of the people that started out with me haven't lived for God in years now. Amen. You know why? Because there was too much enticement out there. And they weren't living for God because they loved God. They were living for God because they had obligation. Because mom and dad went to church. I don't live for God for my mom and dad. I never have. I live for God because he loved me enough to bring me out of sin and fill me with the Holy Ghost. Now, have I batted a hundred? No. I wish I could tell you that I had never messed up or made a mistake in all these years, but I can't tell you that because I'm human flesh. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. So there's times that we make mistakes. You know what you do? You know what some people do when they make a mistake? They throw in the towel. This is it. I'm done. I messed up. I, I can't live this, man. Oh, come on. Don't lie. To, don't listen to lies of the devil. You can live for God. Living for God is not really that hard. My pastor down in Bonwer, when we were raised up as kids, he used to say, if you serve God hard, it's easy. If you serve God easy, it's hard. Yeah. Amen. You know what that simply means is? If you just kind of half-heartedly do this, you're going to struggle the whole time you're trying to live for God. Yes, but if you buy into this thing, lock, stock, and barrel spiritually, guess what? You ain't going to have no problem living for God. All these people coming around throwing all this junk your way, you're just going to let it bounce off and keep on going. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 All right. Let's go on further. This is a faithful saying worthy of all acceptation. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. These things command and teach. Now Paul is telling Timothy, you're going to be preaching this. You're going to be teaching. I want you to command, to command you to teach these things. Let no man despise thy youth. Look at this. But be thou an example of the believers. And he didn't. He doesn't stop there. He tells him to to be an example in word. That means your that means your conversation. That means talking. And then when he said in conversation, that don't mean conversation. <laughs> that doesn't mean conversation. Amen. That word conversation there means in your life, in the way you live. Amen. And in charity, which is love. In spirit, that's in your spirit. Not God's spirit. God's spirit's already there. Amen. He's already a, he a step ahead of you anyway. So in your spirit, in faith, and in what? Purity. What is holiness? It's purity before God. Hallelujah. If you're going to live holy, you're going to be pure. Anybody out there? Amen. Then he goes on to say, till I come, I want you to give attendance to reading. Anybody here ever read your Bible? Uh, every day? Most every day. Every month. Once a year. Where I need to or not. Hallelujah. No, 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 no. Every day. It should be a daily thing. It should be a daily routine. You know what? Well, I'm busy. I, you don't understand. I have a really busy uh, day every day. I, well, I do too some days. I mean, some days it's really crazy. I used to get up and go to work early in the morning and drive sometimes an hour and a half, two hours, and then climb on a billboard and start working on that billboard when the dew got off of it. Because in East Texas we had dew out here. We don't know what that is. Amen. But... In East Texas, I climb those big old billboards way up there and, and hang up in the air all day long on just a little couple of ropes and, and uh, you know, watch the cars go by and paint that billboard and get home at dark or after. Amen. And get back up the next morning and do it again. You know what? You're thinking, man, you don't have any time for anything doing that kind of stuff. You better take time for it. Hallelujah. Take time to get the Word of God in. Why? Why do I need the Word of God? I can't I just read it. When you're, when you're preaching, yeah, you can do that. You can follow along with me as I'm preaching, but that's not going to help you. Amen. That's your meal for that night. Now, if you took that same kind of attitude toward eating your regular food, you'd be starved to death in a week. Hallelujah. 
you know, I'm eating, I'm eating three times a week. I'm eating Sunday morning and Sunday evening and Tuesday evening, you know. Well, you ain't going to last long that way. All right. So then he goes on, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, and to doctrine. Hallelujah. He said, no, I want you to pay attention to those things. Pay attention to reading, getting the word of God, and pay attention, amen, to exhortation. You know what exhortation is? That's preaching, basically. Amen. And he's telling this little young preacher to preach. And then he said, but also I want you to pay attention to doctrine. Yeah, amen. Hallelujah. You know why? Because doctrine is the most important thing you got in this business. Amen. The doctrine that Jesus gave the church, hallelujah, and he was the one that gave it to us. Amen. Some people don't, don't want to don't follow what we believe and teach. And the reason they don't want to follow this is because they're following some other church, big church body that's worldwide, you know. Uh, it's called Universal Church. That's why, that's what their name means is universal. But you know what I'm saying? What, what it is is, uh, amen, they, they came along 350 some odd years after Jesus was gone and, and, and the church was already established and, and, you know, everything was in place and, and all of a sudden here they show up. And they're trying to start a church. I'm sorry, there already is a church. We don't need another one. Yeah. Hallelujah. And guess what that church teaches? Baptism in the name of Jesus. The repentance of your sins. The infilling of the gift of the Holy Ghost. That's what the original church taught. Amen. Amen. So why do you want to come along with something new? Why do you want to try change something that God has already established? You can't do that. Amen. It doesn't work. A lot of people followed it though. So they did work. Amen. But you know what? Yay. Now it's coming out. All kind of crazy stuff has come out about it in the last few years of their of their people, you know, messing around with kids, you know, all kind of crazy stuff. You know why? Because you don't have any power or authority there. Yeah. Amen. Papa is the authority. Amen. You know, they don't even really believe what they teach. What do you mean? Now, I'm not getting off on anybody's religion. I just want you to understand something. Because they tell you that Peter was the first pope. Well, if Peter's the first pope, then you need to believe what he taught. Yeah. Yeah. Hello. Amen. Why don't you follow your original pope's teachings? Okay. Yeah. Now, let's get off that soapbox. We'll get on set. <laughs> you don't have that, all right? Okay, so take heed unto yourself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them. What doctrine? The doctrine of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost. That don't even exist. That's not a doctrine. That's a man-made thing, okay? We're talking about the doctrine that God gave. Hallelujah. Amen. Jesus is the one in John chapter 3 tells Nicodemus exactly what he must do. Got to be born again, Nicodemus. How can I be born again? I can't go back in my mother's room. I'm an old man. She's not even here. What are you talking about? You've got to be born again of the water and of the Spirit. Hallelujah. Jesus set the plan. He told the apostles the plan. Go ye into Jerusalem. Carry there till you be endued with what? Power from on high. Hallelujah. And, and then he ascended up into heaven and left it with them. They went back to Jerusalem. They found the upper room. They went in. They waited. They tarried, the Bible said. And all of a sudden, the Holy Ghost, there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind filled all the house where they were sitting, cloven tongues like as the fire set upon each of them. And they all began to speak with tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Yes. Hallelujah. Now, that didn't cost you nothing. All right, so let's look at this same scripture in the Amplified. 1 Timothy 4, 7-16. But refuse and avoid irreverent legends, profane, impure, and godless fictions were grandmother, mere grandmother's tales. Are you grandmother's? Say, oh, me. <laughs> and silly myths. And express your disapproval of them. Train yourself toward godliness or piety, keeping yourself spiritually fit. That's what I was saying a while ago. You ain't going to get spiritually fit at Planet Fitness. Most of us ain't even going to get physically fit there. 
Because the only reason some of us go is for the little water beds in there that you can lay on and spray the water on your back. How and the massage chairs. Hello. Oh, I just oh I nailed some of y'all just then. Mm -hmm. Verse eight. For physical training is some of some value, useful for a little, right, Sister Holly? But godliness is useful and of value in everything and in every way. For it holds promise for the present life and also for the life which is to come. So he said godliness is useful and the value in everything and in every way. All right. This thing is reliable, worthy of complete acceptance by everybody. With a view to this, we toil and strive, yes, and suffer reproach because we have fixed our hope on the living God, who is the Savior, preserver, maintainer, deliverer of all men, especially of those who believe, trust in, rely on, and adhere to him. Come, continue to command these things and to teach them that no one despise or think less of you because of your youth, but be an example, a pattern for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. Till I come, devote yourself to public and private reading, to exhortation, preaching and personal appeals, and to teaching and instilling doctrine. Do not neglect the gift which is in you, that special inward endowment which was directly imparted to you by the Holy Spirit, by prophetic utterance when the elders lay their hands upon you at your ordination. All right. So Paul tells Timothy in verse 8 that godliness is a valuable thing, not only for this world, but also for the world to come. Godliness is interpreted in the Greek, Eusebia. Number one, it means reverence and respect. Number two, it means piety towards God. Now, reverence for God and a life of holiness in the world but know that the Lord has set apart him that is godly. For who? Did you see that? The Lord has set apart him that is godly for himself. If you're living a godly and holy life. Now can I tell you those two are synonymous? A godly life and a holy life mean basically the same thing. And if you're living a godly life or a holy life. Amen. God has set it up. That you are godly for him. Hallelujah. You're doing it. You don't. Nobody lives in holiness just because they. You know I just think. I think it would be cool just to live in holiness. No. You do that because you love God. Amen. It, this is a love driven thing. Hear me. It is a love driven thing. Amen. That's why you got all these yahoos out there now that say, Oh, yeah, I ain't live that stuff. You know, come on, you don't have to do all that stuff. I'm not doing all that mess. And guess what? They don't feel God anymore. Jesus. Guess where he went? Where you left him? Hallelujah. All you got to do is go back there and they can find him. He's still there. Amen. But they walked away from him because they did not want to line up to his word. They, You know what? That there's something about living for God. Come on. Now I've had the Holy Ghost a long time, so you can't tell me anything about living for God. Amen. But I can tell you a whole lot. And and there's times that you you get up in the morning and man, I mean, it's 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 all angels and man, I'm talking about you can hear angelic choirs, you can hear all kinds of stuff. And then there's other mornings you get up and every devil in hell is in your living room. Believe that? Yes, sir. But when you're living for God, you don't change just because the devil shows up. Unless you just get mad. I get mad at him sometimes. I get upset with him, and I might tell him a thing or two. Amen. But I'll let the angels take care of him. Hallelujah. Hey, you short shrimp. You see that big angel standing right there? He's fixing to knock you into the middle of the next week. You better get out of my living room right now. Yep. Yeah, so, they are and are to become his holy people. Leviticus 11, 44 says, For I am the Lord your God. Ye shall therefore sanctify yourselves, and ye shall be holy. Why? For I am holy. Guess what? You will never enter heaven without holiness. Okay. Amen. You'll never get there. You know why? Because he's a holy God and he demands a holy people. Amen. When you stand before him, he's going to say, remember that little story he gave when he was here on earth 
about the guy that threw the wedding and nobody wanted to come. So then he tells his servants, go out there in the highways and the byways and, and the hedges and bring me some people. I want this wedding full of folks. I don't care if he's living under the bridge. Bring them in here. Okay. When they brought them in, the custom was they would bring them in and they would give them a wedding garment to put on over their clothes. It was kind of like a little cloak that just went around them. Over their clothes while they were at the wedding. That way everybody was dressed, you know, you didn't see their beggarly elements, okay? And so, here they are all coming in the wedding, and all these guys have just, they, they just went out and got them out from under bridges and bushes and everywhere they could find them. And they brought them into their places packed, man. And then all of a sudden, the guy that's over the wedding gets really hot. Because in his wedding, even though he's given everybody a wedding garment when they come in, there's a guy sitting there without it on. Now, you're, you're thinking, now that's pretty crude and rude, and you know, I can't believe God's like that. You know what? God wants us to have that wedding garment on. We've got to be different. Amen. But that guy was different in the wrong way. Amen. You know what? He still looked like the world he came out of. Oh God, did you, did you get that revelation just then? He still looked like the world he just came out of. He didn't have on the wedding garment, Sister West. So that's why the guy that was over the wedding feast got so upset. And the Bible said he was so mad that he had the people take him and bind him hand and foot and cast him into outer darkness. Read it, it's in there. Because... That you're not coming into here looking like that you just came from out there. I'm telling you what, Je what Jesus is saying. You're not coming to my wedding looking like a slob. Okay. Man, is that plain enough? Hallelujah. You're not coming to my wedding not being holy, in other words. Because this is a holy wedding. Do you understand we're, we're, we're looking toward what? The marriage supper of the Lamb, right? Okay. When we go to the marriage supper, you've got to be dressed properly for the marriage supper. Amen. Holiness has everything in the world to do with it. Because you're going into a holy wedding ceremony and you better have on the wedding garment. You know what the wedding garment is? Holiness. Amen. All right. Now let's go a little further. All right. With a view to this, oh, let's see where we're at. Okay, let's just go on down. <clears throat> so, so we know that uh, godliness is a valuable thing. Godliness is the awareness of God's power and authority over every aspect of our life, and a determination to honor Him in all our conduct. Did you hear that? Godliness is the awareness of God's power and authority. It's, it's realizing that now that I've received the gift of the Holy Ghost, there is a power and authority in my life. Did you know there was a power and authority in your life before you got the Holy Ghost? You didn't realize it. You thought you were making your own stupid decisions. You had help. <laughs> you know, that's why, Sister Elizabeth... When, when you've been driving that truck in the military all day and, and it come evening time and you're off and, and they say, okay, you guys can go do what you want to do for a while. Your, your brain said, oh, you know what? There's a bar right down the street. I hadn't tried that one yet. I think I'm going to go hang out there a little while. You didn't make that up. That wasn't your thought. There was a spirit directing you. I've got a Bible for all this. I'm not just saying this stuff. There was a spirit directing you. Mm. So you were actually being led by a spirit, but not by the spirit. Hallelujah. We, we need to get what we are led by the spirit. Okay? And, and that only comes after you have submitted yourselves in true wholeness to him. Hallelujah. Now... Godliness and holiness both denote, denote one reality. A godly person and a holy person are both set apart. 
Amen. See what the word Hebrew word used for holy in, in a Leviticus eleven forty four is kadash, and it means sacred, holy, holy one, saint, set apart. Yeah. Hallelujah. You know what that means? I don't look like the world. I don't act like the world. I don't smell like the world. I don't smoke like the world. Amen. I don't stagger like the world. Okay. All right. Let's go a little further. Look at what Paul said in verse 10, Amplified Version, with a view to this, that godliness holds promise for their present life and also for the life which is to come. We toil and strive, yes, and suffer reproach because we have fixed our hope on the living God. Yes. Wow. That's why we have our hope fixed. Who is the Savior, the preserver, maintainer, deliverer of all men, especially them who believe, trust, and rely on and adhere to him? Now, Paul says that because we chose to live godly, holy lives, we will suffer reproach. The clincher is because we have a fixed hope. You know what a fixed hope is? That you know where your hope is at. Woo! Hallelujah. Okay. Now, I'm not a sailor. I ain't never been a sailor, never cussed like one, nothing. Amen. Never had a tattoo like one. But sailors sail. At least most of them do. And, and, and what, what they do is they get out on that boat and, and back this is this is ancient technology. Do you know they still use it? It's a little more modernized today, I think, than it was back then. They have a thing called a sextant. Now, I don't know nothing about how that thing operates. All I know is they find the North Star. Because everything out there in the sky revolves around the North Star. The whole mess. Does. And so that North Star is a constant. But say constant. constant. Alright, it's a constant. So they lock onto that with that sextant. And then somehow or another they measure down from there with the horizon line. I don't know how that works, but anyway... They can tell where they're at by doing that. Now you go figure that. That took somebody with some brains more than I got to do that. I can find the North Star and I can find the horizon line. But to tell you anything beyond that, I have no clue. But I want you to know it's because there's a constant out there that those guys would sail. Now occasionally some of them would get off because you remember, uh, remember Christopher Columbus? Obviously, he had never been trained in the fine art of using a sextant because Christopher Columbus is looking for a new route to India and ends up in America all the way around the world. Hello. Made a wrong turn when you left the harbor. Amen. So, anyway, so there's a few out there, you know, that were supposed to be sailors that didn't have a clue. But anyway, he discovered America and we got it now, so it's great. Okay. All right, so... We've got to have that fixed hope. That fixed hope. We have come to totally trust and rely on and adhere to God. The world doesn't understand us. They just think we're a little weird. I've had them ask me, why do all you ladies always wear dresses? I said, go ask them. I just want to see if y'all know why you do it. Amen. <laughs> They can't seem to grasp the fact that someone can depend on something they can't see rather than wrapping themselves up in the same things that they wrap themselves up in. We do not find our pleasure in this world but in our God. Hallelujah. That's why we adhere to Him. Whoa. That's why we hold on to Him. Amen. Because He is a fixed object in our lives. Amen. He he said, I'm the Lord thy God, and I what? Change not. What did he say, Rob? Change not. Change not. That means he's fixed. So if God is fixed, and then I believe it was David said, my heart is fixed. So if my heart is fixed on the God that's fixed, then I'm pretty well fixed. Hallelujah. Amen. And, and you know what that does? That's why the wholeness comes in here. That's where it plays its part. Amen. That godliness. Amen. The Bible says godliness with contentment is what? Great gain. Amen. So I've got to be contented. The only way I can be contented is to be hooked up to some fixed point. 
Amen. Because if I don't, I'm wandering around aimlessly all my life trying to find the fixed point. I'm like Columbus with his new little sextant thing. Going to find a route to India and end up in America. Hello. You know, that's the way it works. I'm serious. In our spiritual world, it works the same way. You've got to understand, though, he is fixed and my heart is fixed. So we're locked in. We're one. Amen. And that's where the difference is made. Now, Deuteronomy 30, 20 said that thou mayest love the Lord thy God, thou mayest obey his voice, that thou mayest cleave unto him. For he is thy life and the length of thy days. The word cleave here means to stick with as with glue. Anybody here a carpenter? Yep. Me. And I use glue. One thing I found out about glue is I can take glue and I can glue two boards together. I, we can just, y'all want me to do this? I'll do this one night. Y'all show y'all. But I can take a glue joint. I can glue two pieces of white wood together. And, and, and I can let it set till it dries. And I can promise you, I can take that piece of wood and I can hit it as hard as I want to on the end of that altar, and that wood will break. But guess what? It will not break on that seam where the glue is at. That's right. You know why? Because glue sticks. Uh -huh. yes. Hello. It Amen. It's stronger than the wood itself is. Right. And, and so when I have that bond with the Lord, that fixed object in my life, I'm glued to Him in love, Woo, hallelujah. Amen. Oh, my, 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 my. All right. Second Timothy chapter 3. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covered as most of with proud, blasphemers, and disobedient parents, and think on holy without natural affection, truth breakers, false accusers, and conflict, trace, fears, despise of those that are good, traitors, highly, heady, high minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having informed godliness, but dying prior thereof. From such, turn away. Now, that didn't cost you much there, huh? Reading. Yeah, all that live will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. That's the one we don't want to hear right now. Okay, Paul tells Timothy that all those who live godly or in godliness will suffer persecution. Verse 10 of First Timothy 4, he says, It's because we have fixed our hope on the living God. There's that word fixed again. A godly person is one who has dedicated themselves and has separated themselves in wholeness unto the Lord from the things and the systems of this world. Did you know there are a lot of influencers out there that will influence your thinking? Getting more and more all the time. Amen. Now, you know, we, we, we make these statements, you know, more all the time. I'll never be one of that. No, 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 I ain't going to do that. I know. And then all of a sudden we look at you and we're like, what in the world happened to them? I didn't think they were going to go that route. You know why? Because you've been listening to the influencers. Yeah. Hallelujah. They, listen, there's people out there who can sell stuff. I, you know, I was a good salesman. I could sell, sell ice to Eskimos. But you know what? There's people out there better than I was. Amen. They could, do, they could just sell circles around me. Hallelujah. Amen. But you know, I'm, I'm talking about the, the world systems around us. Amen. That are constantly pulling for your soul. Do you understand this is not a battle? We're, we've, we've been in Washington, D.C. the last several months. This is not a battle between Democrats and Republicans. This is a battle between good and evil. This is a spiritual battle for the soul of this nation, but it's also for your soul. You know why? Because they're trying to turn this thing into a communist nation. Now, I'm, you know, I'm saying that, but that's the way it is. It's, it, there's a group of them that want to do that. And it's not just in one party. It's in both parties. So don't, don't get all political on them. I'm not there. But I want you to understand, we are binding up those things through prayer and fasting. Amen. We have to constantly fight to keep our heads above water spiritually. Now, if you're living for God and you've got wholeness in your life, you have a fixed point. Yes, sir. 
He is that fixed point. Hallelujah. And as long as I keep my eye... Let me give you an example. There was a clown in the Bible by the name of Peter. Impetuous. Man, he had an attitude. He was cocky. Man, he didn't care what... He, you, he, okay, this goes back to what I was talking about. He was a sailor, okay? He came out of that lifestyle. And every now, every now and then, he would revert back to that lifestyle. He didn't go backslide. I'm not saying that. But, but he, you know, he'd have the thoughts he used to have when he was a sailor. And, and so, so he, he was, but, but they were out in a boat one evening. And a storm blew in, and it was a vicious storm, man. And, and, and man, they were bailing water. Everybody had their Folger coffee cans out, and they were dumping water over the side, you know, just dumping, 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 dumping. And all of a sudden, one of them said, Look, I know they were going down, man. They were going down. All of a sudden, somebody said, Look out, there comes a ghost. I know we're doomed now, it's a ghost. Peter said, It's not a ghost, that's Jesus. And so, Peter, impetuous, hard nosed, aggravating, Peter looks out across that water and said, Jesus said that you bid me come to you. Boy, his brain was not working at all that night. And Jesus said, come. Now the natural man says, you're an idiot. You step out of that boat, you're done. But he was not in the natural. You know why? Because he had his eyes on Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. That, that's the difference between walking in the flesh and walking in the spirit. As long as you have your eyes on Jesus, on that fixed object, amen, you can step out in faith and God will bear you up. You hear what I'm saying? But the moment you take your eyes off of the fixed object, off of Jesus, that's when you're out to, you know what, because you're not walking on faith, now you're walking on your own volition. That's why you see all these, all these uh, fly by night, and I don't want to call them that, but that's what they are because they prove themselves to be that. These little prophets that come zipping around the country, and you know they put them in these big, in these big meetings, and have them preach all these big meetings. Next thing you know, I don't even believe that meat's greasy. Everything that has to do with the doctor, they just kind of walk off of it, walk over it. Amen. I don't know. You know why? Because they got their eyes on him at first. They had their eyes on him. And then finally they figured out, hey, I'm the one walking on water, not him. And when you do that, that's when you start going down. Because you're no longer depending on the one that's fixed. Now you're depending on your own stuff. And God just steps back and goes, okay, let's see how this works out for you, Pete. You didn't want a bath, right? <laughs> yeah. uh, you're going to get one. So Peter's like, Help! You know who he called on? Jesus. Jesus. <laughs> and of course, he just said, Okay, come on. Did you learn that lesson? Yeah, I think it is. Right? <laughs> okay, let's get back in the boat. Hallelujah. You know, Bible didn't even really say they went back to the boat. They might have walked on to the land. Left all the other fishermen in the boat with their mouths open. Up. <laughs> Did you see that? But you understand the whole ball of wax was just simply because of the fact that Peter kept his eyes on the fixed point, on Jesus, on an unmovable point. Hallelujah. You know why? Because God is not movable. He said, I'm the Lord thy God and I change, change not. not. I don't move. I'm the same every time you see me. Hallelujah. You know what? That's what God wants of us. He does not like wishy-washy. I'll tell you that now. Amen. God doesn't want you to be this way one minute and this way the next minute. Amen. And acting like a total idiot the next minute. He's not interested in that. He wants somebody that is holy and pure and clean and wholesome. Amen. That walks the walk, that talks the talk. Hello? That is fixed on him. I'm trying to hurry. I've only got 14 more pages. I'll be all right. I'll be okay. All right. Let me get on through here. In 2 Timothy 3, Paul speaks of the ungodly men who would be in the last day's world. The Bible says that they are men who love not the truth. 
2 Thessalonians 2 and 8, and then shall the wicked be revealed, the Antichrist, whom the Lord shall consume in the mouth spread of his mouth, and shall destroy the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after working of Satan with all power and lying, signs and lying wonders. That's happening now, folks. And with all deceivable ones so unrighteous in them that perish, because they what? Received not the love of the truth. That's what I was just talking about. About these little fly but not uh, preachers and, 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 and these, these little prophetesses and prophets and stuff. That's what they call themselves. Listen, yeah. I, you know, I don't go for all that mess, man. Come on. If you're going to live for God, live for God. If God's going to use you, He's going to use you. Hallelujah. And once He starts using you, it ain't you no more. The moment it becomes you, that's the moment God said, I'm done. Amen. Hallelujah. All right, now, let's go a little further. So, they received not love of the truth. That's what happened to them. That they might be saved. For this cause, God shall send them what? Strong delusion. That's what happens to them little guys. You know what? You know what a delusion is? It looks just like the real deal. Yeah. It feels just like the real deal. But it ain't the real deal. Come on. It's sent by God to deceive you. Jeez. Why would God do that? Because you're not listening to God. You're going your own route. You're doing your own thing. Amen. And because that, God's going to do like you did Peter. He's going to let you sink. <laughs> the difference was Peter cried out to him when he started sinking. That changed his whole outlook on the situation. I wish it would do that with all these other young men that I've seen go down in the last several years. You know why? Because there's some good men that were used of God. And because they got in their own self and their own flesh and they thought they were the ones doing it, God said, I'll back off and let you have it. But if they would just repent and just tell God, God, I'm sorry. I, I, you know, I know I made a mistake. That was me. But no, now they've tasted the world, and they're in the world, so they're going to stay there. They're not coming back out. All right. Because now he sent them a delusion, a delusion. Now, that they should be, believe a lie, and that all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Now, Paul said they would love what? Lovers of their own selves. That's people that are stuck on themselves. You ever see that? Man. I can't stand that, man. I, I, I never have like to, to go go up to greet somebody and they just turn their head away like they didn't see me. Yeah, I, I've had that happen. I really have several times in my life. You know what? I just said, okay, I guess, you know, <laughs> today ain't today. So I'll go on about my business. You know why? Because they're stuck on themselves. And God's not going to use them anyway. I can't use that kind of spirit. And then he said, the ones that are lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. This is the spirit of the last days. People would rather be appeasing their flesh than to be obeying God. All right? Yeah. That's why on Sunday morning, if we had a beach here, it would be full. Yeah. We got a desert and it ain't. You don't attract a whole lot of folks. But Anyway, they would be appeasing their own flesh. But the spirits associated with this are against God. You know, I was in Florida here several years ago. And uh, we were driving down Daytona Beach, just on the beach there, on the beachfront. And it was one of them days. There wasn't hardly anybody out there. I don't know what was going on, but it wasn't hardly nobody out there. But we're driving down the beach, and all of a sudden, we see this church, big church, right there on the beachfront. And between the church and, and the road we were on, was this area and it was covered with all these little poles in the ground with speakers on them like they have in drive-in movies. Uh -huh, yeah. And the side of the church that faced that parking lot, it was a parking lot, the, the side of the church that faced that parking lot had a glass front and there was a pulpit up there and there was a big sign by the gate, Sunday morning service. You pull your boat in there's parking places for boats. You pull your boat in there. You get the little speaker off and hang it on your window like you were in a, in a drive-in movie. And the preacher gets up and gives you a 15-minute sermon. And then you go on your merry way. You have satisfied God. You've satisfied yourself. You've satisfied the preacher. And you're saved. Bless your heart. You better pray that a shark don't bite your ear off. Because you're going to be lost or lost gets. Amen. 
You know why? Because your your mind is not on God. Sir. You just feel like I got an obligation there to church. I'm just go through there, give my 15 minutes, you know, to God. And you know what? That's all he probably heard from you the whole week. And you probably didn't say anything. All you did was pull in there and put the speaker on your window. And probably sat there and talked to the guy that was in, in the car with you about what y'all were going to do. And you didn't even really hear what the preacher said. Which wouldn't amount to anything anyway because a 15 minute sermon don't get you anywhere. But can I tell somebody tonight, amen, it's those that have sold out to, to God. They're not interested, amen, in all the baloney the world has got to offer. You know, I, the Bible tells me that in the last days people would be lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. That's where we're at. Amen. Okay, I'm trying to get on. I really am. Y'all want me just to wait a while and do this other? How much? What time is this? Is it already been up in an hour and a half? Or? About 15 to 9. About 15 to 9. I might just save the rest of this for next week. This is, I still got a couple more pages here. And I really need to speak about each one of these. But anyway, I, let's just stand. You know what? I want us to fall in love with God. Come on. If you have never made him the fixed point in your life, you better do it. Yes, sir. Because this world is fixing to rock and reel like you've never seen it before. Come on. I, hear what I'm saying. The, anti, the spirit of the Antichrist is already in the world. Yes, it's here. It's here. Amen. I've been teaching about it since the 70s. I started teaching in the 70s. People look at me like I was an idiot. Amen. I, I'd start teaching on the New Age movement, and people were like, "What is that?" Yeah. It ain't the New Age. The New Age movement is not new. No. It's been around for centuries. Yeah. Amen. You know why? Because the devil's been around for centuries, and he's the one that instigated that thing. But we are watching the fruition of it now. You know what they're calling for? One world government, one world religion. Yeah. If you heard, if you've been listening to any of the politicians this year, you have heard. Global community. You've heard global government. You've heard all that all year long. Amen. First time I heard it used, and I had been teaching on it since the 70s, was when George Bush Sr. got in office and he was making a speech. And he got up and he started talking about the New World Order. And my mouth dropped open. I looked at my wife. I think we was driving down the road. And I said, did you hear what he just said? I said, from this point forward, it's going downhill. And it started then, and it's been going ever since. Amen. But you know what? I could care less. Yeah, I've got grandbabies. I worry about them, and I pray for them. Amen. I pray for my children, because I don't want them to have to deal with any of that stuff. But you know what? I do understand, hallelujah, that I can get them in church and I can get them to live in for God and they can get that fixed point in their lives, amen? And everything will revolve around that fixed point, hallelujah, amen? Just like everything revolves around the North Star, everything revolves around God in my life. Everything I do revolves around Him, hallelujah. You know, if, you, if you do that, you know how easy your life becomes? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. We, we pray about everything we do. Seriously. We don't do anything without praying about it. And we, we pray, you know, over our car. We pray over our house. You know, God is just amazing, all the things he's done. And, but it's because we pray about that. We don't just, just shoot in the dark and hope it hits right, you know. When we used to just buy old cars all the time, we, you know, we'd go out and buy a clunker and get it fixed up and run it for a while until till the wheels fell off. Then we'd go find another one. But we always prayed and God always directed us to the good ones. Except for the one time we didn't and God, I went and bought a diesel, whatever I was thinking, I don't have a clue. Amen. But anyway. Let's just lift our hands and worship the Lord. Oh my God, I thank you. Lord, I love you. Jesus, I give you glory and honor and praise tonight. Thank you for your word. 
God, your word is established in heaven and in earth, God. And I'm so grateful for your word tonight. And Lord, I want you to help us, God. Lord, to be holy because you're holy, God. We want to be holy, God. We want to follow after you, Lord, in holiness, in purity, God. Lord, we give you praise and glory and honor in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Amen, amen, amen. God bless you. Uh, you can go home. And uh, don't forget Sunday morning. Everybody say Sunday morning. It comes after Saturday night. And we're going to be right here Sunday morning. And we're going to worship the Lord. And we're going to have some church around this house. Hallelujah. Amen. Come expecting. Amen. Good, Ron. That's a good amen. Hallelujah. God bless y'all. Go home. Pass your, pass your books to the center aisle.